All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Colonel JJ Snow. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with AFWORKS, which is the Innovation Wing of the United States Air Force. And I am delighted to be here with you all today for this exciting panel entitled Stronger Together, How Diversity Fuels Bright Ideas in the Federal Government. And joining me today are some dear friends and mentors. I'm just delighted to have all of them on this panel. And we're gonna talk about some of the exciting initiatives and great work that we're doing in the federal government. Let's start off with the Honorable Secretary, Hondo Gertz. Hondo, it's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about your position, what you're working on, and just say hi to everybody. Oh, you're muted. There we go. I'm the first guy. So I know here. Good, uh, good to be with all you guys. And uh, been in uh, in uniform as a government civilian, uh, as an appointee, multiple services and stuff. So uh, been around a lot, and uh, not that smart, but a pretty good poacher. And uh, and love learning from everybody here. And and I guess what I would say is uh, what's really exciting is these kind of dialogues really happening and people doing something about it. And so Jen, uh, thanks for having us here and look forward to talking with everybody and learning from them. Awesome, thanks for joining us. I know how busy you are, I really appreciate it. Michael, Michael Acinelli, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to lately. Sure thing. So uh, up until September of last year, I was the Chief Innovation Officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And a lot of our work while I was there was really focused on understanding how to improve veteran care and how to improve the outcomes uh, from the payment arrangements that we make when we purchase uh, veteran care. So it's the whole value-based care movement in the context of the Veterans Administration. And uh, it was a lot of fun, uh, but I felt a need uh, given where we were with the pandemic and uh, the global impact of the pandemic and you know, beyond the physical uh, care elements, uh, also the mental health care elements, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. And I felt like I needed a bigger platform uh, to pursue some of these initiatives. And so I uh, ventured out and now working across a range of opportunities and initiatives uh, across government, across the startup ecosystem, really aimed at, um, you know, bringing a lot more simplicity a lot more affordability and a lot more equity to the U.S. healthcare system. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm so grateful. Glad to be here. Born CISA with DHS. Welcome. Tell us about yourself and I love your pink room. Thank you, JJ. I'm so glad to be here with such a great group of folks. Um, I am chief of the innovation hub at CISA. Uh, we've been around for about six months at this point, but going gangbusters and excited to make some good things happen in bringing innovation uh, to CISA and highlighting the great innovations that are already taking place within our organization. I have a background in the intelligence community, so I've had the, the grand pleasure of spending time um, in DOD and um, appreciate every moment there, but uh, I'm very excited to be part of the ecosystem within a, in innovation and have found some great people to partner with. So glad to be here. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. And last but certainly not least, dear friend, Chris Manuel, thank you for taking the time out to join us from Monterey, California. Tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Well, my, uh, I guess my somewhat recent news, um, uh, retired from the uh, military after almost 34 years of service in uh, November. Um, and I'm continuing with service uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School. I'm currently the Associate Dean of Research for Technology Development. But the exciting thing that we're working on is the Central Coast Tech Bridge and really looking at how do we leverage the latent capability at NPS with the students, professors, and making the connections throughout all of the tech bridges now uh, worldwide, not just through the country. But uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things that we're looking at with uh, the tech bridge and that uh, the whole world. Awesome, thank you for joining us. I know you've been super busy too. Everybody's got a lot going on. So I'm really grateful because we kind of pulled this together last minute. Thank you all. So let's talk a bit about diversity. Um, all of us are really intentional about this. Uh, we all value diverse teams and diverse perspectives. And 
this has been something that has played in time and again to our success stories. And many of you have them and have seen them firsthand and have helped to build them. Let's talk about how diverse teams and diverse perspectives most recently have been helping out in your organizations around generating new ideas and innovating at the next level. And let's start with, with Secretary Gertz. All right, please just Hondo, that's the secretary stuff. <laughs> Hondo, um, you got it. <laughs> so so uh, again, uh, it's a little in a little culture shock. Uh, previous to this job was down at Special Operations Command, you know, very focused, small, agile group. Uh, now here, Department of the Navy. So uh, that's both Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, $148 billion a year, 130,000 government folks. And so the experiment has been how do you take an agile mindset and apply it to such a large organization, you know, building everything that's, you know, from seabed to space. Uh, but what we've really kind of focused on, I think, is, is two core elements. Uh, our real competitive advantage that we'll be enduring is our um, thirst and capacity to learn. And our ability and thirst uh, and curiosity to learn is directly proportional to our ability to create a culture where everybody's respected and we really think of diversity more than just a social norm, but a competitive advantage and be very thoughtful about that. Uh, and when I say diversity in all dimensions, um, who we are, what color of our skin, where we're background, uh, which is crucially important, but then um, who do we know? What are our networks? What skill sets do you bring to the table? How do you think about a problem? And then um, with that kind of as an overarching intent, what are simple practical things you can do every day uh, that make a difference. And what we've found is the best way to implement it's at the small team level. And if you can kind of give the right picture to a small team, uh, give them some tools, maybe a little coaching, uh, you know, here's a couple, we call them plays. You know, here's some plays you could use. Um, you can have transformative level effects that then allow you to whatever your other initiatives achieve it at scale and at speed. Um, where we failed before was kind of approach it as just a social thing or at the individual level or at such a philosophical level, there's no practical tools. And so while everybody agreed philosophically, nobody did anything different day to day. And so we actually had, weren't really achieving any meaningful change. Everybody was well-intentioned. Uh, you know, this isn't, I, I firmly believe everybody is well-intentioned in this area, but they're not, we don't, necessarily give them good tools uh, and help them along the way and then get the get the ball rolling and then once the ball's rolling they'll take off so that's really I think what we've been trying to do and, and I guess the last piece is respecting that everybody's got a role to play and uh, you know I'm the acquisition guy so you know you can get all wrapped up in processes well we need folks that are good at rapid acquisition we need good folks that are good at very hard nuclear power plant things we need to link across boundaries. Chris and his team at NPS bring a lot to the table. So if we can get that right culture with an outward focus, not an inward focus, um, that's really, I think, helping us um, do it in a manner that is not one person dependent or two, um, have such a long time cycle that by the time you get to the end of it, folks are just worn out because they want to do the right thing. They just don't know how. Uh, yes, yes to all of that. Yes. And that, that ties in perfectly with, Michael, some of the work that you've been doing with the VA focused on how to enable our veterans, uh, both active duty, but then the transitioning veterans and our veterans that are retired now, looking at how to scale solutions, looking at how to give people a voice and how to bring people into spaces to solve some of these tough challenges. Do you want to talk a bit about that? So that's definitely part of my past life. And I don't want to sort of position myself as speaking on behalf of the agency or as related to any of that. So I'll just put that disclaimer out there. Um, but the context of, of bringing folks together, um, either through formal structures, uh, such as a challenge. Uh, so we, while I was there, were working on a suicide prevention grand challenge. Um, and the purpose of the grand challenge was to really bring all people together uh, to sort of paint the picture of the problem and, and get a lot of smart people 
uh, from around the world to really think about what hasn't been done because uh, the numbers haven't really moved. And so if you measure any initiative, so if you look at diversity and maybe any diversity objectives you have, and you measure the outcomes that are being achieved, every process I think that exists, every structure, every organization, the outcomes it is getting is a function of the design of that organization. Everything is happening by design. I could apply that to healthcare, I can apply that to anything. And so if an organization is not achieving its diversity objectives, it's by design. If it wants to achieve said diversity objectives, it needs a new design and it needs to build with the outcome in mind um, versus what typically happens when an incumbent is trying to innovate itself, uh, you ultimately run against the forces of inertia and the forces of this is how we've always done it. And you know that's usually what, what you, you face uh, from a challenge standpoint. And so the purpose and the approach of a grant challenge was really let's break down all the pretenses, let's admit we don't have the answers, let's bring a bunch of people into the fold, let's create a cash prize and say, give us solutions and may the best solution win. And so that, that's really what we were trying to do. Um, I, I would hate to think the problem of suicide death is intractable because it's something we have to solve. Um, it is and remains the number one clinical priority for the VA. And it's just one of those things where until we get to the root problem or the root cause of the problem, we're not gonna solve it. And getting to the root cause of that problem requires asking some really hard questions and facing some ugly truths. And I just don't know if we're ready for that. Um, I'm not sure if that was helpful, but you know. It is, it definitely is. Well, and that's a, an important discussion too, but getting um, everybody in the room to have these messy dis discussions, that's how we get to the right answers because you've got to understand the problem first. And in order to get at those root causes, we really have to have everyone's voice at the table so we can understand it. Yeah, that was that was awesome. And again, nice lead in to Sabra with building the iHub that you're doing at DHS. I know you have very intentionally sought out a lot of diverse perspectives, um, a lot of diversity across agencies and across partners. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, thanks so much for mentioning that, JJ. I think it has been a very intentional process. Um, I, I was challenged with how do we stand up an innovation effort at CISA? CISA is only 2,100 fed strong. So we're a very small federal agency. And we recognize the fact that although we have a relatively small number of folks, we have a very large mission. And so the only way we were really gonna bring in and, and create a lot of new innovation was to create a lot of partnerships and to recognize that there were so many different great things happening, so many wonderful people that we could learn from, so many people to listen to. And it's been really remarkable to see the great projects that we've been able to be part of and bring to life because of exactly that, finding different people in so many different locations. I would say we've also been able to discover, um, it, obviously DHS, there are eight component agencies. We recently formed what we're calling the collective, which is representatives in innovation across um, all of DHS, as well as within our headquarters element as well. So you can well imagine how many different perspectives and the different skill sets and areas of interest and the missions themselves, how various they are across all of DHS to include TSA or the Secret Service or CBP. It's, it's remarkable. So we have common challenges, we have common interests, and we can work on common problems together and solve them. So it's been very exciting. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Chris, you have a similar mission in that not only are you uniting across the forces around innovation, but you're also uniting allied partners and international partners in a space that's building um, education for all. Let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing with the ETC and, and some of the diversity initiatives that you guys are, are implementing out there at, at NPS. Well, I, for one, I definitely see diversity as key for um, better understanding. Um, a model that uh, we're following 
It's something I did when I was uh, still in the military. Uh, I was the, uh, the lead planner for Cyber Endeavor. And uh, one of the things that we did with the, we designed the panels to where we would always have differing opinions on the panels. Um, so we would take uh, people like from the uh, Electronic um, Frontier Foundation, maybe a, um, um, an RB CPT operator, uh, someone at the, um, um, at the OSD level for policy, and then maybe someone from a company from IBM. And the moderator would really pull the differing opinions out. What would happen almost every time is they would disagree, and then you would see them kind of pull off to the side. Uh, you'd see sidebar uh, conversations going on. You'd see um, networking, and those networks uh, ended up being something that people have worked with for years. Uh, I did something like this when I was a student at NPS, where I really focused on uh, operational art from my uh, special operations background, bringing in academia and industry. So I've done this twice, and I would say very successfully, pulling from diverse backgrounds. We're going to expand that at NPS because we're an educational institution as well. Um, so we are looking at not only uh, working with other schools, uh, companies, organizations, we're really expanding uh, the scope of that diversity far beyond anything that I did uh, during my DOD time. Awesome. And that touches on a, a great lead in to our next topic, which is networking. Hondo, I know you're a huge fan of establishing really diverse networks, really inclusive networks. And that's something that I got to see firsthand when we were down at Softworks and now with Naval X and, and again, continuing to expand that out with the different tech bridges. Um, let's talk about the importance of networking because we all have them. We benefit as individuals. We all get leadership benefits mentorship benefits, and then the networks that we build also benefit our respective organizations. And uh, this is something that, that you've been leading for a while in government. So definitely want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, again, great. I, 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 uh, I, every, when everybody else is talking here, I could just kind of put bits and pieces together and, and kind of to Michael's point, you know, it's, and uh, Sabres, it's, it's about design. And, and Chris, what you hear is, you know, you can design things for the unknown. You can design things to create new opportunities. If you don't take an active role in that, you're not going to get something new. Um, because uh, even with different people in the same design, you're going to get likely a similar uh, output. And, and so, you know, part of what we're trying to do, you know, it's a little bit of a let's get real and then let's get better. We tend to want to get better before we get real and then we... We don't really maybe solve the right problem uh, and we feel good that we're doing something. We all love activity. Yep. It's a little harder to measure ourselves against outcome. And so part of that get real is creating those networks to help you see yourself even when you can't see yourself or see your organization. Most organizations think they understand themselves. Most humans think they understand themselves better, much better than they do. Uh, so, you know, some of us, we're lucky to be, you know, I'm married to our high school sweetheart, so I have a you know, self-appointed ego deflator that keeps it real all the time. But that's really, really important. And that's why networks are really important in creating this mutual trust. So you create trust that, you know, Chris can tell me, I know, I know that's a great idea. No way. Here's, here's where you're kidding yourself. Or here's where you got a blind spot. Or here's an opportunity, you know. I, I, I laughed. I was an early one. You know, the artificial Christmas tree was invented by a, a toilet roll, a toilet brush uh, company. And they took a toilet brush and cut it in half and then stacked them up and made, that's how we have artificial Christmas tree. But you would never have thought I didn't know that. two things together. And so when you create the design to bring things together that don't normally come in an environment of mutual respect, um, then you can create these things. Because if you can't get real, you can't get better. Uh, and I guess the last, and, and Chris and I probably share some of the same uh, learnings from SOCOM, create relationships before you need them. Uh, because if you're trying to create a relationship when you need it, um, you know, that's, you can, that's really hard to generate trust. And so, you know, this idea of creating networks 
uh, across multiple dimensions will illuminate opportunities you don't even know yet exist. Uh, and then quite frankly, we all suffer in big organizations and you need a mutual support network because this is hard, right? And creating your own personal resilience of trying to drive change wherever you are in your organization or just surviving, having networks will give you the resilience to get through those really challenging days uh, we all have in particular over the last nine months have really had. But you've got to do it before you need it. Um, and then you'll illuminate opportunities you may not have ever uh, thought to ask for. Awesome. Yes. And, and Michael, let's go to you because I know you were building networks inside and now outside of government. And a lot of this has really come together in great ways, positive ways to help a lot of people. Um, can you share a bit more about what you're seeing and what you're continuing to build? So I'll just echo everything Hondo said is awesome and on point. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm going to top it. So I'll just get really <laughs> tactical and say, here's literally what's going on. You know, it, just building on the point of building networks before you need them, building on the point of having folks who will keep it real and tell you the truth, because uh, the truth is so important. When, when, when you're on a mission to achieve something, uh, having access to the truth is essential. And I think a very diverse network where you can get points of views from all sides uh, is essential to getting at the truth. And so for me, while I was in government, it was building those relationships. Now that I'm outside of government, it's continued to expand those relationships in the government while bringing relationships uh, from the private sector, from the startup ecosystem, from corporation side into the mix to say, if we're trying to achieve this, and the this, so the big thing I'm working on is inventing the future of healthcare, which, you know, it's very ambitious, so might as well try. Um, and, and so really getting perspectives uh, from all stakeholders uh, from the government standpoint, so working across HHS and DHA and VA to say, you know, these three agencies represent about 30% of the U.S. healthcare system, you know, what can we think about that we could do differently to impact the whole? Um, and so those, that, that's a hard conversation to have, um, but it does lead to some truths. And so it's been exciting is the short, short, short answer. And um, again, echoing everything Hondo said. Awesome. And that uh, really nice. Let's roll right over to Sabra because you have this challenge as well, working with all of the different agencies under DHS. And bringing all the various tribes and, and their different parts and pieces together into a viable, cohesive network, and then bringing in those external partners as well. That's right. That's right. I, I think, you know, as you'd mentioned previously, it's, it's being very intentional about bringing these people together to ensure there's diversity of thought and diversity of experience, skill sets. But I would say the way I really hit upon it was... Um, Someone had told me once upon a time, you know, map out your networks because you're going to see some holes you would not have noticed otherwise. And that was absolutely the case. So we know that the DHS world is a finite world, but you may not have had all of those networks built. So being intentional in reaching out to certain people was really important. I'll also add, you know, we have the... Um, Federal Innovators Salon, which has been kind of the extension for us, right? Which was broader, broader access across a wider group between you know, DOD, the intelligence community and broader US government folks has really allowed us to be, again, intentional about who we need to bring to the table. I will say, I'm sure none of us thought that you know, a big gaping hole was, you know, the entire healthcare world for those of us in national security. But when March came, who did we need to reach out to? And it was a struggle in many instances to find the right connections, um, but it was so vital for the safety of this country. And wonderfully, so many people came to the call and that's been a, a great thing to see. But I just wanna emphasize, you know, not only the, the importance of mapping, but also build those relationships for, for you need them, just like Kondo says. Sabre, so, so can I ask you a question? Yeah. So we're talking here a lot about organizational design and big people and big jobs and all that. Um, we're all four or five individual humans. Uh, I'll speak for myself. Last nine months have been 
sometimes personally challenging from a resilience uh, standpoint. Um, maybe you or somebody else, you know, we're, we're, you know, I think we're talking here to a pretty broad audience, maybe not trying to architect the healthcare system or the Navy or something. Uh, but I think a lot of the principles I've learned I try or I've tried to apply in kind of daily life is, would you say the same as, as you're in a high profile position trying to get through every day, like everybody else? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Um, the thing that I've found recently is the importance of renewing energy and being able to connect with folks across the USG that really do resonate with you in a way that helps you renew that energy. Because let's be honest, innovation is tough work and pushing that rock up the hill day after day is just incredibly challenging. And being able to connect with folks who help you build that internal resilience is so important and finding strengths and uh, strength in others. Chris, what do you, do you have similar colleagues out in California that you think might be able to, can you shed some light on that? that aspect of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of those colleagues actually is on the call, um, JJ Snow. Uh, Jen and I, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times when uh, we're, we're running up against the wall and we've got to, you know, hey, I've got to get this done or I'm running into this, we definitely pick each other up. Um, and um, it's great to have uh, someone that's not going through the exact same thing that you're going through because then it can turn into a pity party which is never where I want to be and is never where uh, Jen is. Um, but uh, she's also been a great network for us. Both of us uh, uh, graduated from NPS. Uh, both of us love the school and want to see great things happen for the school. So, um, you know, part of the network that she has helped us with is the uh, joint innovator, uh, uh, joint scouts. We, uh, um, uh, and, and Sabre, you're part of that as well. Um, we've been doing those virtually, but there's a time we were traveling together um, and just, uh, you know, just uh, speed dating with companies from six in the morning till 11 at night. Um, you know, I, I, in, in fact, I came to the conclusion, I have no idea how Jen does it. Uh, I think I've got a great work ethic, work ethic and I met someone that outworks me and I had to admit it, she outworks me. But uh, uh, the other part of uh, our relationship, she introduced us to DefenseWorks. Uh, DefenseWorks has over 70,000 connections. Um, you know, I was hired to uh, stand up something called the uh, Emerging Technology Consortium. Luckily for me, Naval X had almost the exact same uh, uh, lines of effort that we were trying to do, yet I was trying to do this as one individual uh, with people saying, well, why would we do this for Chris Manuel? Well, then it turned to, we're well, doing this for the Department of Navy when we became a tech bridge. So that network definitely helped us and that network's growing. The other network that we're using and relying on, and I think we'll really rely on in the future, is the Academic Venture Exchange. Uh, so ABX has 34 of the top research universities uh, in their organization. Um, we are looking at um, something we are calling the um, um, Quantum Education Consortium uh, and pulling those uh, schools together, leveraging uh, the curriculum that are going on in the top 10 schools in the country to come up with one, and then looking at how do we, how do we address DOD problems with quantum at NPS and at AFIT yet leveraging that network to move all of us forward. Um, the intent here, even though we're at a tactical level, really is getting at a strategic problem. How do we start thinking about quantum uh, technologies as a country to where uh, we are driving the standards for it? So that's my uh, uh, spill on networks. I could not survive without them. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. And, and Chris, you pick me up just as much as I, I pick you up. And, and I think we've all been in those loops where we've all texted or called each other and had those discussions. And uh, I love the positivity. So thank you all for that. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, well, let's talk about the human piece because all of us as leaders, 
the people in our networks, in our organizations, our teammates, they fuel our success as individuals and as organizations. What do you do as a, you know, a leader, uh, as a mentor, as a peer in your organization to really enhance that, to create that space for that human element, element to really be appreciated um, and to create the space for people to come together in meaningful ways to be successful on whatever project they're tackling. And it could be something really small or it could be a monumental task that's going to take multiple years. Hondo, what's your, uh, what's your philosophy here? Oh, uh, microphone. It depends a little bit on what it is. Um, um, but I think you start by creating a culture of safety, right? If you can create a safe culture, whether it's with your friends, whether it's with your family, your peers, or somebody else, um, uh, and you enable that, um, not for the wrong reasons, but the right reasons. And then I think I, you know, what I tell folks is they're looking for mentors. Good leaders love to talk about leadership. Good leaders love to mentor people. Good leaders love to connect because I think the Sabres point, it recharges us. It's a little bit of my own self-defense mechanism from, you know, facing, you know, we're all facing challenging problems wherever you are. Uh, and so to some degree, it allows you to um, recharge your battery in a different way and um, kind of scale what you're trying to do uh, because um, it allows you when you're on your task, you can be on your task full point and then allows you to get a recharge cycle. And so just letting one, letting teams or your networks know you value that and you're looking for those opportunities and it's okay to ask. Um, uh, and, and asking, and then the second thing I, I spend a lot of time, I got to remind myself all the time, uh, but almost every time I talk with a group or a team or a leader is, is this idea that reaching out for help is a positive sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. And, and saying that over and over as a leader, talking about your own frailties and your own areas where you've got challenges. And again, back to let's get real and let's get better. Um, if you can create the culture where reaching out for help, whether it's personal help or technical help or just a shoulder to lean on, uh, if you can do that, it is the most and single most enabling thing um, you can do in wherever you are as an individual, as a teammate, as a, uh, as a leader. Uh, and, and so every time, you know, and you got to remind yourself that and you got to make time for it. And yes, sometimes it's inconvenient. And sometimes it's, you know, it can be another rock in your rucksack. Um, but then you've also got to have the humility to know as a leader, it's okay to reach out for help too. Um, so I see a lot of leaders who help everybody else or teammates, or we all, we all have the ones on your team who are helping everybody and working, and but they won't ask for help themselves. Um, you know, that, that to me has been, uh, it's, you know, that mindset will transcend any organizational design. It will jump over uh, cultural barriers or diverse barriers. It's, it's hard for people to believe it. And they're going to watch you a hundred million times and they'll look for the time when, when they don't perceive that's the truth. But if you can get that mindset um, uh, and, and us and, and remind ourselves we're just human too, then, then at least for me, that's what's helped. That's a, that's a really, really important point right now, because I know a lot of people are struggling. And, and Michael, you and I have talked about this. We did the Thrive event this year, uh, specifically focused on countering um, the stress uh, and, and PTSD and the, the suicide rates that we've been seeing. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about that. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, as far as that human element? And, and I, I really like what Hondo had to say, because too, too often we forget about ourselves and we also were afraid to reach out and ask for help. And that's such an important point. No, uh, I think Hondo hit the nail on the head. I'm very much in the forget about myself category. I, I take myself back to uh, the Black Lives Matter protest uh, this summer. It was happening right outside uh, the VA. Uh, we were working remotely, but obviously we were all still uh, sort of witnessing sort of this upheaval and uh, sort of where we were as a nation. And I had to look at my team, which is very diverse, and we 
we're able to create a safe space, Zoom call, and we kind of talk through it, right? Can't just ignore what's actually happening and say, where are the reports? Or, you know, I'm waiting for this innovation thing. Uh, so it's, it's about being real, uh, creating a safe space and kind of talking through sort of everyone's perspective and experiences and having, having it become real uh, for members of my team who are not African-American, who could hear from me uh, sort of how I experienced it and some of the things I was going through, and it was a shock for them. Uh, and then I also was able to benefit from hearing from team, teammates uh, who reported to me who were African-American, and they had stories that were shocking to me. And so just having everyone hear it and then having people say, I had no idea you all were going through this. So it sort of brings it to the fore and it allows you to actually function better as a team because you have a better sense of what people are actually going through or where they're coming from as things unfold. Um, so it's one of those things that ultimately um, every business is a people business, even though software is eating the world, as some, some venture capitalists would like to say. And so we, we cannot forget about the human element and we cannot ignore the importance of truth uh, when it comes to human interaction. Because if you build something on a foundation of lies, it will crumble. Um, and I think ultimately resilience comes from being able to see the truth, know the truth, and deal with it. Ignoring it, you know, you know, overcoming adversity is really how you build resilience. And, you know, there's a lot of adversity that comes with being alive. And so we need to embrace it. And that's how we got stronger. And I don't want to be preachy, so I'll stop. You're not being preachy at all. I love it. Um, having people on a team in a space with you where you can share that, that contrast, you can share those tough times, and you know that you can have those open, honest discussions and really go back and forth, ask, ask hard questions and, and talk about messy stuff. Yep. That helps tremendously. And that's how the best teams I've been on have been more like a family than a team because mm -hmm. we have those discussions. And I know I can pick up the phone and those people are going to be there for me if I need them to because of that trust that we've built. So that's, that's tremendous. And um, Sabra, I, I know this is, you know, similar to the military with, with law enforcement as well, working across spaces and across the nation. Um, they're also reluctant to talk about trauma or just sometimes come forward and, and share. And um, especially because the DHS is super busy right now, a lot going on in the world, cyber and, and everywhere. Um, how, how are you balancing that out to take care of your people and to make sure that they're, they're getting what they need and they're being heard? I think we've all been in, in remarkable teams that are running at 125% because the country demands it, there's an emergency, there's a need, and there's nothing that you can do except go flat out. And that's just simply not sustainable. And it's not human, it's not real. And so I think being able to recognize that, to have empathy and compassion, not only for the team, uh, for the agency, but ourselves as well. And to say, you know what? I'm gonna give everybody else a break, but I'm gonna give myself a break too. Um, I had a friend who once upon a time told me, you know, she lived at 125% all the time. She said, every once in a while, I have to have a 2% day. And it was a good way to give herself that rest so that she could renew herself for everyone else as well. And so I think, you know, those of us who have been both fortunate enough to, to be part of those demanding times um, to help our nation's security, um, we have to be able to be compassionate. We have to listen. We have to be there for each other and for ourselves as well. Uh, and, oh, go ahead, Hondo. Well, it's a little bit like tempo training or going to weight room, right? You're, you're not going to walk in the weight room and then just start to put 400 on the bench. Maybe Chris would, but the rest of us won't. You know, <laughs> on day one, you've got to, so you got to build, you've got to actually back to a little bit of design or individual design you've got to build your own personal resilience. You've got to build organizational resilience and you don't do it by going flat out all the time. You know, it's a little bit of tempo training, sprint, take a break, sprint, take a break. And I think um, 
where where we all, I mean, again, I, I really identify with the comments there of if you're not careful, you convince yourself to go 125%, but you just drain the battery and then your 120% is like 50% of what it used to be. Um, yeah. And so if you think of it that way, then we can, you know, be there for the long term. Because um, being awesome for like a week is great for a week, but not, you know, not where we need everybody for the long haul. Exactly. And, and Chris, I, I know out at the Naval Postgraduate School, this is a, a balancing act for our students, many of them that are coming from the field into an educational environment for the first time, maybe in years. Um, and, and there was a lot, of a lot of discussions that you and I have had around this, um, specifically balancing that stress, that transition, um, but also providing that non-attributable uh, space for messy discussions to promote education at the same time. What are your thoughts on this? And, and that's a, a great part of being at uh, an academic institution. You can have those discussions in the classrooms. You can um, have those relationships with students and people that you work with where they feel comfortable talking to you. Part of it is building that within the organization, yet you still have a mission uh, so the way that I've uh, managed that is normally I will talk about um, the vision uh, of the organization. And then when I'm sitting down and I'm talking to uh, the person that may be coming in, uh, that may be working with me, uh, it could be someone that's temporary, it could just be someone that I've hired. I start asking them about their personal goals. And then I try to map what they are trying to do, what they're trying to achieve with the organization's goals. It's much easier that if those are aligned and people see where those are aligned for people to be able to move with the organization. And you also establish a relationship with them where they're able to tell you, hey, I know that you have my best interest in heart. Um, these are some of the things that I'm going through. But I think that's established up front. And uh, this was something that I kind of stumbled upon early on my, in my time in Special Forces that uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, I learned this from a mentor um, and now I'm a mentor and something that I pass on to others. Well, and but let's I talk also, about that too. Uh, I'm sorry? We're going to talk about that too because I want to get into mentorship next. Okay. And, and like uh, um, everyone else on, on the call, you know, I am one uh, that, that does have, have to kind of pull back the reins on myself. Uh, I had a sister pass away in, um, from COVID. And one of the things that uh, um, Amarondo uh, had said to me was, make sure you take care of yourself. And I told her, well, I, I'm, one of, I'm a very, from a very large family. I've got 200 some nieces and nephews. Uh, there's 17 kids. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, as we become the older ones, there was a time I was a little one, now I'm an older one. You know, your responsibility is to the younger ones. But I had to think about what she said was, hey, I do need to take a step back for myself uh, in order for me to be effective for anyone else. Yeah, that understanding how we can best serve others by serving ourselves first, making sure that we're taking care of our health is good, our sleep is good, our stress levels are good is crucial. And it's hard. It's hard to do. I'm very bad at it as well. Um, but it's something that I have to constantly remind myself of. And, and all of you at one point or another have reminded me of as well. So <laughs> for that, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, but let's talk about mentorship, because I know I have had some incredible mentors in my career. And I feel like um, this is an ask that continues to come up from across the services, across the agencies, private sector, People want to know, how can I be a mentor? How can I get a mentor? What does it mean to mentor? And how can we do it better? Um, all of you have done this to a certain extent or have been fortunate enough to have mentors in your life. Can you share a bit about your thoughts about mentorship and the importance that it plays, especially in a diverse and inclusive environment, creating that culture that we all want? Ando, go ahead. Um. Yeah, maybe a couple thoughts um, uh, on it. One, I think we sometimes talk ourselves into either consciously or unconsciously only mentoring people like us. And so we see a version of us coming up and then we, and I think back to this, you know, one of our core challenges in organizational design is if that happens, you're never going to 
that design artifact by itself preserves status quo generationally. Uh, and then the other thing is, I, when I was at SOCOM, I did a fun thing. I, I called it reverse mentoring. I had lieutenants and you know civilians who had been in for two years as my mentors. And, and I would say, okay, I'm going to have a mentoring session with you, Lieutenant Joe Bag of Donuts. And, uh, and that was twofold. One, you know, they, it was such a, such a rank gap that they were, they're not going to tell me what I think they, I, I want to hear. And two, it was modeling for them through being a mentee, how to be a mentor. And, uh, and I got some really, you know, if I wanted to learn what the best, how is everybody thinking in the generation? Uh, coming up, what's frustrating them and stuff. I mean, we all go, we, we use lots of different paths. Um, what I guess my last would say was um, don't ever confuse mentorship with sponsorship. Uh, and far too many times we get into that, you know, who's your C daddy or whatever the thing is. And, you know, a mentor relationship is not to get somebody promoted. It's not to assure they get a rank or anything else. Um, it's really to help that person answer questions about themselves not create a path for that person. And where mentorship, I think, has gone awry is when we confuse mentorship with sponsorship. Uh, or we view mentorship as we're going to mentor people we like uh, or not create the space where folks are comfortable asking uh, for somebody to be a mentor who, who is not like them. And, and I tell everybody, your best mentor is normally not in the organization you're working with. Very rarely is there a good mentor in the organization. And the more tangential you can be, uh, li more likely the, the more value the, of the mentor because they're not going to tell you what you think you want to hear kind of thing. Yeah, and that's so crucial. Um, some of the best mentors I've had uh, most recently have come from the private sector and from areas that I never expected because what they've done is they've actually opened that aperture and, uh, and Michael, this is something that we've touched on a bit um, yep. in talking about the importance of mentorship and personal growth and how to grow yourself, but also how to grow others. So um, let's let's hear what you have to say on this. So I think this will be my opening line from now on. You know, I'll follow up. I, it's hard to follow what Hondo just said. So I'll try and add to it. Um, no, I, he's absolutely right. Hit all the all the points. What I'll add to it is I found the value in having mentors that are further along in their careers, mentors kind of at the same place, and then mentors like like again, Hondo said it, who are sort of not where I am in my career, and sort of having that open dialogue of let us mentor each other. Because uh, I think I, I can mentor um, those who have more experience, those at the same level, and those who are just coming up. Um, and so for me, it's been very, very helpful um, because, again, it's about understanding myself a little better uh, in different contexts and then trying to shed a light of understanding to others as they deal with things and, and sort of come up with, have you thought about it this way? Uh, so, uh, I've had a mentor now for you know, over 15 years. It was my first, you know how you start in a job. So I started in consulting in 2006 and I was assigned like a career coach and that was it. He couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> 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 and so, so, so they're mentors that, you know, it just, it grows from there. Um, and to Hondo's point, it wasn't about the sponsorship. Um, it was really about just the mentoring because, uh, you know, we only worked in the same organization for four years and, and, but the mentoring continued. Uh, yeah. So again, it, it's, 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 it's essential uh, to success, at least from my perspective. Um, it kind of goes back to the thing about if you, again, Honda, I'm sorry, I'm just going to keep saying things you said, uh, but you got to keep it real to get better. You got to get real before you get better. Um, and so it's really about understanding and getting to the truth because that's the foundation for whatever outcome you're trying to get. And that's it. Yeah, spot on, spot on. I, I'm mentoring a young man who is 23 and a marketing expert right now, and I'm learning so much. I have no marketing background at all. And the 23 year old perspective on what's happening in the world right now is enlightening. And so we're, I'm mentoring him, but he's mentoring me just as much. 
and Sabre, we've talked about this from the cyber perspective and for what you're building with iHub and, and bringing in the next generation. And especially because so many young people are active in cyber, we've talked about the importance of mentorship in this space, uh, both for ourselves as well as the younger generation coming up. Absolutely. And I think you're right. There are so many young folks who are coming in and that's very exciting. And I think it's an opportunity for so many of us to really give back, right? I mean, none of us would be where we are today had we not had great mentors who helped shape and help us grow and learn. But I, I certainly agree with what we've heard here, which is it really does take, I think, listening to what somebody really is hoping to achieve and then crafting your comments to really ensure that you're getting to the heart of, of the issues and, and helping that person grow. I think there are a lot of informal opportunities to mentor in ways that have never existed before. Or maybe, maybe I've just gotten a little bit older. It's <laughs> also gives you a lot more opportunity to find people who are looking for that kind of advice. One thing I have noticed and have seen, I think as we start to uh, pull in more and more diverse uh, folks all the time, not everyone's been exposed to what a mentorship process looks like. And I, I don't think there's, as um, in other countries, perhaps they have as strong a, a culture for mentorship. And so, you know, teaching people how to be mentees and then eventually mentors is, it should be okay too. It's not really something that I think we've gotten comfortable with, but as, as it becomes more and more important um, in growing professionally, I think we have to get more comfortable with saying, this is how you do this and this is what it looks like. So a lot of good opportunities, but it's exciting to see. It is, it is. And Chris, that's a, a perfect lead into what's happening out at NPS right now with our students up and coming and some of the new technologies that you're bringing into the classroom and the curriculum with them. Yeah, the, the um, many, many mentorship opportunities at NPS. Um, some of those I take on myself and some of those I really connect with my network. Going back to your earlier question, because sometimes I'm not the best person to mentor someone and recognizing that. I really like uh, uh, the point that Hondo made about the difference between sponsorship and mentorship uh, because there is a difference. But um, yeah, they're, they're, as, as someone who's had really good mentors um, you know, and, and received really good advice that's got me to where I am now, I try to be that uh, for others. But uh, again, a big part of it is knowing when I'm not the right person. And sometimes it's, okay, I, I need to find you another mentor and then get the, them to the right person. Yeah, and that's important too, is making sure it's a good fit. I have a lot of people that come to me and say, hey, what should I look for in a mentor? And I tell them, always start by looking at and making sure your values and ethics are aligned and then look at where you want to go. What is your path, whether that's personal, professional, and see how they're going to be able to help. And then also the final piece is where can I give back? So if you're mentoring or being mentored, it should be a two-way street. Everybody's benefiting from that. We are at the top of the hour, so let's go around. I want to ask everybody, um, for 2021, what is one challenge you would love to see us tackle? And then what is one success story that you'd love to see us celebrate? Hondo, let's start with you. I'm going to defer to Michael so I can say I'm going to agree with what Michael said. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you're on the spot. <laughs> I wish you didn't say that. Um, you got to give me that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You got him, Hondo. <laughs> So what, for 2021, what is yep. one challenge you'd like to highlight and see us really focus on and tackle? And what is one success story you'd really like us to celebrate? And this is as a nation? It could be as a nation. It can be as an organization. It can be as the federal government. Um, I'm okay. All of those. All of those. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and do it as a nation because uh, you know, I'm no longer part of the federal government. So the context... You know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, the optimist in me, which is kind of drowned out over the last couple of months, still sees us crossing a million um, 
you know, dead Americans uh, before the end of this year. And I would love for us not to do that. Uh, that would be my big, big thing. Uh, so, Chris, sorry uh, about your sister. Um, and it's the thing that still bothers me. And it's, it's when I look at 2021, um, I hope it's a milestone we don't hit. Uh, the thing I hope we get to celebrate is actually finding out uh, that these vaccines are effective at the level that creates some immunity beyond, you know, is it three months? Is it five months? So those would be the two things. Like, you know, that many people don't, that many more people don't die. And we find out that these vaccines are actually very, very effective longer term. So I hope I didn't like bring the room down, but that's what's on my mind. No, we're all in this together. And I love it because that's exactly the kind of discussion we're here to have. So thank you for that. How did, should, should I go to you next? Or do you want to wait till the end? And then you can say you're, you're, you're doing everyone's. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep mine simple. I think we, if, I think our opportunity um, slash challenge successes, if we can get back to the place where working together is perceived as the first uh, act, not the last act in desperation, whatever the challenge is, COVID, everything else, and that we value getting people together to solve problems as, our, uh, as a way of doing business, not dividing folks to solve problems. Uh, that's both my hope and uh, challenge for all of us. Awesome. Thank you. Sabra, how about you? Well, I also don't want to be a downer, but um, I think it's important for us to really take a cold, hard look at what diversity means and in regards to national security and cyber in particular, and to be very intentional about how do we ensure that we have a diverse population two, three, five, ten 10 years from now, and how do we do the hard work to ensure that we get that result? We, got, we need some work. And I would say the, the success I want to highlight is it's a group called Leadership Council for Women in National Security. And a year, a year and a half ago, they realized, wait, we keep hearing that you know, there, aren't, uh, there aren't enough women in national security. But they said, no, we know that's not the case. So they gathered over 700 resumes and delivered that to both uh, incoming potential administrations uh, prior to the election in November gave them a binder of 700 resumes and said, here are women that can be part of leadership teams going forward in national security. So that is a success. I love it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, last but not least, best for last. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I would love to see, um, well, well, first, as far as what it is uh, the government needs to do or, to, or the hardest thing to tackle, um, and, and this is uh, something that we're, we're kind of doing right now, really is how do we communicate? How do we think these things through? How do we get better at this? So I, I really appreciate that you bringing this together. Uh, as usual, JJ, you were uh, on it and had the forethought to think this through. Uh, I'd like to see more of this. Um, you know, a lot of times, like 9-11 really brought the country together. Uh, you see these tragedies going on and the country pulling farther apart. Um, I'm really hoping we don't have some other tragedy that's that, could you imagine the size of that tragedy that would bring the country together? So I'm hoping there's something else. Uh, I'm really hoping that uh, just through leadership and people taking a step back, you know, as uh, Hondo said, really, Getting, getting, we need to get real about what it is that we're doing and who we are as a nation, um, and then take that step forward and, you know, through dialogue, uh, heal as a nation. That's what I would love to see in 2021. I love it. I love it. Um, I am so grateful for each and every one of you today. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to have this very important discussion. I know it's going to benefit a lot of people and I'm wishing you all a very happy 2021. And I can't wait till we can all catch up for coffee or lunch or whatever in person face to face. I know it's coming, um, but 
tremendously grateful to all of you. Thank you so much today. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank you all. Everybody. Thank you.